Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, it's been a long week. Man, has it been a long week, I tell you, man. That doesn't even even describe it. It's Tuesday. I know. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know. Um, I got my drink here, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna survive it. Yeah, that's uh, that's the barrel strength too. It's good. It's very good. Yeah. Well, you had to throw all that ice in it, but yeah. make it cold, man. Yeah, it's really good without the ice. You can actually taste like the spiciness. I'm sure you can. I'm good with my rocks. Oh well, I, I guess I'm I'm never gonna. <laughs> Pull me to the other side. Yeah, yeah. Probably I'm gonna keep not. trying though. Hey, you pulled me this far though. I used to put coke with it. That's true. I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't allow you to put coke with that whiskey. Yeah. Fair um, enough. I what did I bring? I can't remember. Uh, to one of my games a couple of weeks ago, I brought a really nice bottle of whiskey, and um, you know, so there's only three. No, there's only four people that drink in the group, and then there's three people that don't. Um, or something like that. I don't remember what the split is. Anyway, doesn't really matter. There's a split. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, one person, though, took that nice that nice whiskey, and they poured some into a glass, and they sniffed it, and then they added a bunch of Coke to it. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. He was like, well, no, I, I just can't drink it that way any, anymore. But, you know, like, I, I re- it smelled really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well... <laughs> So next time, I'm going to bring you some Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah, we have a special <laughs> bottle just for you. <laughs> yeah. You can pour all the Coke into that that you want. Yep. And I will drink something better. The rest of us yes, who drink it neat will drink something better. Fair enough. Now, if he does that to a bottle of scotch, if I bring it up there, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Well, um, as advertised. I Promised. Guess, um, we're we're going to talk about uh, the interest rates and the Fed and all kinds of economic stuff. Woo-hoo. So you want to start us off? Yeah. So I mean, so I did do some reading and digging into the the idea of having negative interest rates, and and I'll just like I read it and read it and read it. I just it it boggles my mind that a system like that could work. I mean, I get I get the idea behind it. I mean, I, I'm and I'm guessing just. So the idea behind it is is that it's a way to make money move around. That for as far as for the in their perspective at least for economic reasons, um, you don't want people sitting on wads of cash. That that it's bad for the economy. And so this is a way for them to to encourage people to move that money to different places and and invest it. Mm-hmm. Um, now. I would completely disagree with this, and I I think that I think it's a recipe for disaster. I mean, I don't think nobody. Well, there's no way to know what the long term effects of this could even be because it's only been done for a few years in a handful of places. Yeah. Um. I mean, you're talking about an economy like ours trying to embrace this type of policy could have major disastrous outcomes. I think. Yeah. Um. But I'm no economics major. I mean, I don't know. I just I don't think common you have sense. To be. I don't well, and that's <laughs> but that's where I was actually going to go. I mean, the whole I, I mean, it seems so absurd. I just don't feel like you have to have some kind of degree to understand that that this is a problem. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I realize that my little quick overview at the end of the last episode didn't really make sense, and I was <laughs> like, okay, now I, I can I can phrase this better in yeah. a way that makes sense. But the truth is, I can't really phrase it in a way that makes sense because it, because it just it doesn't. fundamentally doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right? Um, in a free market, interest rates will <coughs> always be positive. Yeah. And so I guess we should just start off by going through some background and maybe we can, we can try and make sense of the whole thing. Um, unfortunately, there's like a lot of moving parts here. Yeah. And, and I see things holistically anyway, but I, I find that when I'm trying to explain things to people, I have to break it down into compartments, yeah. which I'm not really good at. <laughs> um, so hopefully you can you can help with that. But, I will do my best. <laughs> uh, what we're talking about when we're, we're talking about this um, these negative interest rates is actually the federal funds rate. Yeah. Um, it's the, the target rate uh, for banks to charge each other for overnight loans. Okay. 
Um, and those overnight loans are there to so that the banks can meet their reserve requirements. Yeah. Which is 10%. Okay. All right. Um, and we can discuss that a little bit too because yeah. that's, that's I've, a I've got a little silly bit to system. say about that myself. Um, but. but so the, the idea is that all banks need to maintain a, a, a cash reserve yeah. uh, that equals 10% of their total deposits. Uh-huh. All right. So just so to start off. there's a run on the bank. <laughs> they can cover exactly 10%. They can cover 10% of that. Yeah. And you see, and that's where I have a problem because I think – I think in a in a truly free society, the way these interest rates would work is, is you can loan out as much money as the more money you have, the lower you can have your interest rate because mm-hmm. you've got more money on hand to do that. And the, the less money you have, the more you have to raise that rate to encourage people to put money into your bank mm-hmm. so you have the capital to loan it out. Yeah. I mean, and ideally, that's the way it should work. And you shouldn't ever loan out more money than what you can pay back out or pay out. Yeah. And then there you go. Well, and that's the that's the problem with it, right? So um, when you put $100 in the bank, yeah. they keep 10 of your dollars. In the bank. <laughs> in the bank. And the other $90, they lend out to somebody else. Yeah. All right. And they do that for everybody. Yeah. So all the deposits, because yeah. you know the loans are where the banks make their money. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know they what they're not in a negative rate situation. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's it depends. I actually, um, yeah. If <laughs> the only way that a negative rate works in a bank loan to an individual, like yeah. in real bank loans, the only way that that works is to the advantage of the bank is if they lose less money off of that loan than they would if they if they just kept the if money. If they had kept the money, which yeah. means inflation has got to be crazy. Yeah. Um, and or, alternatively, that they're borrowing that money from somebody else at an even greater negative rate. Yeah, well, there you go. That you know, would make sense, if too. They're, if they're borrowing money at negative 2% and yeah. they're lending out at negative 1%, then they lose $1 instead of $2 and... The math starts to work, you know. Um, so you have to try and incentivize them to, which in in that to scenario, lose money. I mean, if they're getting money from the Fed, then the Fed's just printing it anyway, so yeah. it's going to lose its value anyway. Well, and the the Fed has a different rate too, by the of way. So they the do. the Fed doesn't use the federal funds rate. So the funds rate is only for for banks to issue to, loans to other banks, yeah. and it's a target rate. They don't have to follow it, but yeah, you know that's but it's a suggested. Idea. And um, so, but the Fed uses a discount rate, uh, which is higher than the federal funds rate. So, hmm. and they're the lender of last resort, essentially, is the idea. Yeah. And um, and speaking of, there's been some news about that in the last couple of weeks, okay. uh, since the middle of September, um, because a bunch of banks weren't able to, to meet their reserves. Yeah. Their reserve requirements. And so they had to borrow from the Fed. And so the Fed looked at it as a cash crunch, yeah. right? Like, oh no, we we tightened up. We you know there was quantitative tightening, so they were reducing the the numbers on their balance sheets. They were you know selling off bonds or allowing bonds to mature, and they weren't buying new ones and and so forth. So um, they had less money on their balance sheet, and they thought that they could bring it down, like maybe as far as only a trillion dollars. Now, by the way, it was like. 400 billion when Bush took office or something like that. Wow. Um, and it got up to uh, somewhere around four trillion, four and a half trillion during the, the height of the crisis um, after the 2008 crash. Really? Um, yeah. And that, and that was the quantitative easing. So they're just injecting all this just cash. Just money just into the yeah, system. Yeah. Um, to try and, and recover, which it, it doesn't actually result in a recovery, but we can go into more detail about that later. Yeah. Um, but in the last week, because of this, well, they got down to a balance sheet of somewhere around one and a half trillion. Okay. And, um, and then there was problems. Yeah. Uh, because the, you know, the banks, there were a bunch of banks that, and hedge funds and what have you that couldn't meet their reserve requirements um, and couldn't get a loan from other banks because there just wasn't enough cash in the system, apparently. Yeah. Um, and so the result was that the Federal Reserve uh, injected um, about $100 billion, uh in new money um, between, well, in the last couple of weeks, and they've got like another 30 or so billion 
um, ready to go out in the next week or so. So wow. in about three weeks of time, the Federal Reserve added about 100 or will have added um, about $130 billion uh, into the market. That's just money in the system, man. Yeah. Um, now, and this is a this is a logical result, though, is what I would say. Now they haven't actually pushed down to negative rates, obviously, no, but no. but they've kept the rates very low for a long time. Yeah. I forget exactly Which, what it is right now. It's like it's hovering low, around a, a percent or so. I something think. like that. Um, yeah. And uh, and they had just and lowered it again. Basically, been that way since oh eight. I mean, they. Yeah, I mean, it got up a little on, bit under Trump. They got up to yeah, you know two and a quarter, or something, something like that. that. It was, um, but they've been dropping still it again. massively historically low. Yeah, um, and, and by the way, Trump is way pushing them, and Trump has made some tweets pushing us to go negative. Yeah, and that's what made me want to talk about this. Actually, yeah. is he's like they they need to bring rates lower, even below zero, down to which, zero or less. Is zero or saying. less, yeah. Which, by the way, is insane because if you understand the economics at all, you understand that in when because according to Trump, we're in the boom. We're the economy's strong. It's as good as it's ever been, but. In the same time, he's pushing for lower rates. You don't lower rates when the economy's good. You keep them. Yeah. You want to raise them so you have somewhere to go when it crashes. Yeah, and well, and let's come back to that because that Keynesian thing, I think. Well, is, yeah, that's that, not. I don't. I'm Austrian, so like yeah. I don't. I'm not a You're Keynesian. Austrian? Oh, I'm an Austrian economics. Okay, My economics <laughs> are Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> You don't so, look Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> Only in my economics. Yeah, that blackface confused me. Oh, yeah, to throw you off there. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, the I, I think it's an obvious result that they would end up having to inject a bunch of cash into the market. Because yeah. um, it, if these people who run the Fed know anything about economics. And they do. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, then, well, I think that they know things about economics right up until the point they're appointed into these positions, and then they suddenly lose it and all. And then they lose it all. But um, I agree with that. You know, just like a if you look at supply and demand charts and prices and so forth, if you just understand the relationship between supply, demand, and price, yeah, um, what you're looking at in an in interest rate in a like greatly simplified manner. Um, and the Austrians look at this a little differently, and I'll, I'll come back to that too. But um, in a greatly simplified manner, interest rate is essentially the price of money. Yeah. Right? Um, and so if you lower the price of money, <coughs> there's going to be greater demand for money. Yeah. Uh, if you push the interest rates down, you're encouraging people to, to go into debt, to take loans. Yeah. Um, and if you are doing that and you're not incentivizing banks to make loans – yeah. Um, then what obviously happens in in the end here is like so all these banks uh, like everybody wants loans and they're having to kind of piece them out in whatever way they want but they still need to make money and the more yeah. loans they put out there even at lower interest rates the more money they're likely to make um, which also creates problems but yeah. um, then but all these banks are doing the same thing so when you're looking at for at those other banks to say hey we just need to borrow however many millions in cash uh to meet our reserve requirement for the night and they're like no i mean we we are we put out 91 percent of our funds too (laughs) um so uh we can't cover you and and nobody else can cover you and so suddenly what you end up with is that the only one left is the fed yeah and the fed then they maintain some level of reserves too, but if you have a lot of banks and, a bunch and of funds banks. and so forth, it's basically a bank run for the banks, right? Yeah. Um, you know, needing the money to cover their reserve requirements, then you end up right here where you're you're yeah. creating 130 billion dollars out of thin air yeah. to cover all these balances. To feed to the system, yeah. Um, and so it, I mentioned how the Austrians look at interest rates, like so. Like I said, the simple explanation is that it's just the cost of money. Yeah. Um, now, the Austrians look at it in terms of time preferences. Yeah. So uh, what you would say is um, having something now versus having something later, what's the difference between those values? And that's essentially your interest rate. Okay. Right? So if a particular product, we'll say, yeah. um, is worth 105 to you now and it's worth 100 to you later – uh, then, in order for you to lend out your hundred and five, um, or your hundred bucks, we'll say, yeah. in order for you to lend out your hundred bucks 
then you would want to charge essentially a 5% interest rate. So you make up the difference between the value now and the value, value later. later. Gotcha. Um, so it's about who needs things now and who needs things later and making determinations on that and, and, well, and how much, trying to how quantify much, that value. Yeah. And how much can you make on that money if you have it now versus if you have to wait? Right. Because that's usually what it comes down to with businesses and, and whatnot. Yeah, is, and that's is, exactly. Is it going to pay to make this loan now or should mm-hmm. we wait till later? Or make this uh, – uh, Acquire, acquire you know, something yeah, now. Yeah, buy this now. This yeah. piece of equipment is the right mm-hmm. time for us to get this. Or, right. Exactly. Um, and I, I think that that's a more realistic way of looking at it. And as you said earlier, in a free market, what happens is that um, banks set their own interest rates based on whether they need money or they whether they need money on hand yeah. or they can need to are put they, money out to yeah, people. If they exactly. have a, an excess of cash, they're going to lower their interest rates to try and encourage People uh, to people make to borrow. Homes, yeah. Um, and if they have, uh, you know, a too small an amount of cash, then they're going to raise their interest rates to encourage people to put money in the bank. Exactly. Um, and then these competitions between banks are going to set kind of an, a, a general uh, interest uh, yeah, rate. Yeah, you end up with flushing out a sort of kind of rate, but you'll yeah, still have variances. Yeah, the same way that gas costs, you know. Like, yeah. Um, exactly. If you put a bunch of gas stations, like gas stations all tend to cluster together around the yeah. um, interstate, interstate ramps, yeah. you know, and so they all end up being about the same price. Yeah. And it's because they're all trying to compete with each other to determine, you know, to with their decision about how low can I push um, my gas prices and still Meet make enough. Of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. And so, you know, the same thing works for currency. And and it actually it gives us the opportunity a little bit to address um, one of the questions that my f- my friend asked way back when we talked about economics before, um, and I said we'll get to it. <laughs> We've gotten to it. <laughs> well, we're here, <laughs> you know. Uh, and actually, there's a couple things that I want to address. Like it, we mentioned inflation, and and I, I want to go into a little bit more about what inflation really is, yeah. um, and you know why it's a concern to inject a bunch of money into the into the system. Okay. Now, uh, inflation is a is really a devaluing of your money. Yeah. All right. So, um, what you can buy now with a dollar uh, will require a dollar five or a dollar ten. You know, some period Over down time, the road. Yeah. Um, that's the inflation rate, and uh, you know, deflation actually improves your situation even though they talk about it in a bad way yeah, they like always... worry about deflation we can't have deflation but what deflation really does is it improves the situation for the consumer well it, it increases your purchasing power exactly it makes that dollar get you further right so um what cost you a dollar today only cost you 95 cents and yeah. and in a in a natural state deflation occurs um, for any particular products, yeah. uh, as you increase production and the supplies, then the prices naturally go down. Well, exactly. Um, and technology should encourage progression. And technology should encourage deflation. So we should be the way technology is moving and advancements are happening now. Yeah. We should see our dollars be worth more and more because there's because efficiencies are in the system in a way that prices should be coming down. Yeah, and and you should look at these these terms and say, well, like who named these? It seems backwards then, right? Like yeah. inflation sounds good, but it's bad for me. And deflation sounds bad, but it's good for me. And you know, like where did these terms come in? And you might think that there was some guy in the background saying, all right, if we name this just right, like the America's <laughs> Freedom Act, then people <laughs> right. won't realize that we're taking away their fourth amendment rights entirely. Or the Patriot Act. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, the Freedom Act was the follow up. Oh, it was right, the to follow-up, the Patriot yeah. Act. Um, and so, but what it's actually describing is it's, it's a ratio essentially of the money supply to, uh, commodities and production. Okay. Right. So, um, if you have a a high level of commodities in production, uh, underneath the money supply, then it deflates the currency. Um, it's good for the consumers. It's not great for the producers though, uh, because they, you know, they spent money, um, that was at a higher value at the time that they produced the product yep. and it's worth less when they receive it down the line. Yeah. Um, and, uh, of course, if you have a high money supply, like injecting 130 billion or, <laughs> right. you know, 4 trillion over a, a decade, decade yeah, know, right. um, then, uh, compared with the, the amount of commodities and production, then it inflates, um, it, 
it's an inflation of the currency supply essentially yeah. versus production and, and uh, the commodities available in the market. Yeah. So, um, and you know, I, I hope, <laughs> I, I think that I, I had a better idea how to say that in my head than how it actually came out. But um, it's really about the money supply versus production. Yeah. You need production to back the money supply. Otherwise, money supply doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Like if it doesn't have something to back it, gold, production, commodities, whatever, it has to have some value behind it to make it valuable. Right now, it's the U.S. military. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that. Um, and so and I'm, I'm hoping that this maybe will help explain it. So there was a question about how to add inflation uh, or how to add currency without inflation. Okay. And the way you do that is that you you add currency commensurate with um, with increases in production, with increases in commodities. Okay. So, for example, um, if you wanted to keep uh, the the value of the dollar as pinned to the gold, uh, like an ounce of gold, at the same rate. Yeah. And suddenly there was this huge vein of gold that was found and it's all being pulled out of the ground and, and so forth. Well, then you could um, add currency to the market yeah. to match. Based on that, how much yeah. gold is moved into the system, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And it works the same way with any other commodity or with production. Yeah. And generally in this country, you're not looking at a particular commodity. You're looking at like the overall production of the society. So yeah. as you increase production, you can add money to the system without causing inflation. Gotcha. Right. Um, and I, I hope that that, I hope that that clarifies that. Yeah. I don't know. Did it clarify for you? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, it does. Um, to, to an extent. So, but the, the real problem with the pushing down the lower interest rates that we alluded to earlier uh, is that it encourages debt and it encourages spending. Yeah. Um, Which and, debt is bad for an economy. You don't mm -hmm. want an economy like what we have here that's built on debt. And ours is built not only on personal debt, but the government is in debt. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's, there's everywhere. $22 trillion now, I think. Yeah. Everywhere you look, there's debt. And, and what you'd want to do is encourage people to have that nest egg and to be putting that money back and have something, you know. Because mm -hmm. that's how you increase future production. Exactly. Exactly. And um, that's how you, and you would be, you would be on solid ground there. You'd have a stable economy and you're still probably going to have some ups and downs, but they won't be like they are now where it's like, just like destitute, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, and this whole thing is built on this Keynesian idea that uh, an economy is built around consumerism. Yeah. Um, the idea that that people getting out and spending money to buy things is what drives an economy. Uh, and I would disagree that with that just from its foundation. On a, yeah, on its face. Um, but what we've we've moved past Keynesianism into something completely different oh, at this yeah. point. Well, I mean, but I don't know that everybody out there even understands what the Keynesian idea is. So yeah. I, I, well, might I mean, as well, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, that is the idea behind Keynes is that, you know, you just it's it, it's the broken window thing where when the window gets broken, that's yeah. money that got spent that mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. exactly. The the broken window fallacy. Yeah. Um now the uh Oh, I got a little off track there. Sorry. My bad. I may have pulled you that way. That's my fault. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's all right. Um, now, the problem with the, the Fed and this idea of – like, so governments are going to love this Keynesian ideology about yeah. your money into the system. The people that get it first yeah. get the most value out of it yeah. because they get to spend the money before inflation kicks in, mm. essentially. So It's true. The banks is where they're giving it to first. The federal, uh, you know, the federal government and the banks is is who gets the money That's first. Where it starts, yeah. And so they get to spend and lend and whatever um, when the money has full value. And by the time it trickles down to us poor slubs, um, it has lost its value. Inflation starts to kick in. People the, start to the realize system that there's realizes. a greater system, yeah, greater amount of money in the market than needs to be, yeah. or than that used to be it at, used at to the be. very least. Yeah. Um, so that value diminishes. And so the value diminishes, and the the people at the top get full value, and the people at the bottom don't. Yeah. Um, it, it actually increases the the difference, um, or the the spread between the very rich and the very poor. Yeah. This it this creates that divide. This way of controlling the money supply. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also drives prices up. It doesn't. 
like it improves the economy for the businesses once again because yeah. they're going to get it before the consumers. They they ha- have to spend their capital to produce. Yeah. Right. Um, and so they get it. You know, when it's maybe uh, I'm going to use round numbers. This is this yeah. is totally arbitrary. So don't yeah. take don't this literally. This, yeah. But um, you know, so the the government and the banks they get it first. It's 100 percent of the value at the time of the printing. Yeah. Um, then you know these businesses get it next. They invest the capital in production. Uh, they spend it when it's about eighty percent, we'll say, yeah. um, of its original value. Yeah. And by the time it comes down to the consumers, uh, you know, after the company is, is spending the money to increase production, they're also paying employees, et cetera. Now the employees have it, and they get to go out and spend and buy stuff. Yeah. Well, now it's you know sixty percent of its value. <laughs> exactly. Right. So um, and it drives prices up because this this glut of money in the system, in the market, and this glut of spending, um, you know, it, it with the money supply high, the, you know, the demand for things goes up. As more money's out there in the system, more people are buying things. Um, the inflation is also kicking in, which is also driving prices up because the value of that money is less. Uh, all around, it, it works out badly. And if you just think of it in terms of your own personal finance, is it better for your future production? Yeah. To go into debt and spend everything you've got, yep. or to put money away, exactly. And and that actually brings up the other side of it. Like you could never run your personal finances in this way, the right? Way like you, wrote, yeah. you know, you can't you can't live off of debt and spending. Yeah. Like you have to be able to do something with your money. You have to be able to produce something with your money to build it into something more. Exactly. Right. And the only way that you can do that is through saving and investing. Yep. Um. And and that's the other problem that it that it creates here is that through encouraging uh, the spending and like borrowing and spending, um, you're actually reducing the ability for the, the economy to produce more in the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And that's <clears> the, <throat> and that's what I was getting to earlier is that that's why you want it built on that fin- foundation of, you know, solid like yeah. stability. And you're encouraging really bad habits because yeah. the, the truth of the matter is that in a, in a um, in an economy that is uh, in creating a whole bunch of money out of nothing, that's yeah. not built um, on debt. Yeah, that's not driving the production increases to to counter the increases in money supply. Yeah. Um, it, it generating in an inflationary environment. Yeah. Right. In an inflationary environment, the best thing that you can do is spend your money as soon as you get it. Exactly. Exactly, because if you save it, it's just going to be worth less and less. Right. I worry about that with the money I'm saving mm-hmm. now. I've yeah. got to do something with that money to help it keep up with inflation because that money could be worth nothing by the time I need it. Yeah, buy gold. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, that's... <laughs> I, that's uh, that's what I've done with a lot of my money that I had just sitting around. I, like, I have some investments too, but yeah. like I bought gold. Oh, actually... I have a referral code for goldmoney.com. I don't remember what it is. I Uh-oh. think it's I think it's the Liberty Mike. Oh yeah? Yeah. Really? Um I I'll, I'll have to look that up. I should <laughs> We'll have to get back with everybody on yeah, that. Yeah. Um so like I I bought a bunch of gold through goldmoney.com. They yeah. store it for you. The fees are low. Um the yeah. uh they only charge you a half a percent over the spot price, which yeah. is the best you can found. Yeah. Um and uh you know, I, I really like the system. You have a choice of banks all over the world that they can store it. Like, they literally yeah. store your gold. your gold. It's physical gold. It's yeah. not paper gold. Exactly. Which there is um, more of than, I have there some is of that too. than there is physical gold. <laughs> yeah. I have some of that, too. But, yeah. um, I mean, but that's your your best thing because gold has just always kept its value. I, like, yeah. I'm definitely – I'm a gold bug, like – well, I'm there's there's nothing else you time, can but. nothing else you can find over time that does what gold does. Yeah. I mean, ev- everything seems to tank at some point. Gold and silver, I would say. Yeah, when they, we, when we went off the gold standard in yeah. this country, um, they had pinned the dollar at thirty five dollars an ounce of gold. Yeah, uh, and right now gold is trading uh, is selling somewhere around fifteen hundred yeah. an ounce. Yeah. So just calculate that inflation. <laughs> right? <laughs> it tells you how far we've gained. Two twenty thousand percent, something like that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but something else talking about the negative rates that happens is so you, you end up in a situation it it like you were talking about um, negative impacts. It's it encourages people not to put money into a savings account. 
Because if you have money in a savings account in a negative interest rate environment, Mm -hmm. a lot of times you're paying to keep your money there. Yeah. You're paying to park basically with your money. Yeah. Um, where, and that's just the whole idea. That's where kind of, I was saying earlier, like, it's just so foreign to me. The idea that you would have a savings account that loses money is just insane. Now I know a lot of those Nobody in their right mind would do that. Well, uh, well, and a lot of the banks waive those or pay those because they don't want people pulling their money out of the bank. Right. But I mean, you know, just the whole idea that that could even be a thing is just just insanity. Yeah. Well, and like a, like I said earlier, banks don't want your money if it's going to cost them. Well, yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. But and I think I think that type of situation would push people to move towards a, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or something like that. Because yeah. why would you put your money into a bank when you can when you're going to have to pay for it to be there? Yeah, this versus, is where I get people riled up. Okay, yeah. I don't believe in the cryptocurrencies. Yeah, you're, you're not um, a Bitcoin guy. No, not right now. I mean, yeah. I think that it has potential. I like the idea, but the idea that it's actually uh, comparable to something to a real commodity like gold, I think is well. Is just my problem with this, I just don't see how it could ever be a stable. It could never be a stable currency because it's too volatile. It's, it is right now, that's for sure, yeah. because it's an investment vehicle for it's, people. That's I mean, why. I, and I think as long as you look at it as an investment, mm-hmm. that you're fine to invest in it. But yeah. you need to understand that, like any investment, you need to track it and understand it before you start putting mm-hmm. your money into it. Well, and the other problem is that the the central banks around the world aren't mm-hmm. going to accept this. Well, no, like they're absolutely yeah. opposed. Like. The the nations of this world yeah. want control over currency. Over the money supply, yeah. yeah. Um, and well, because and that's, that's a strong that's, power to have. So while I was reading about the negative interest rates, that's something else that I came across, that a lot of these countries that are enacting these rates mm-hmm. are pushing towards going to a cashless society. Oh, yeah. Because that's that's a big part of it is when you Electronic have Electronic record of every purchase you of make. Of every purchase you make. But the other thing is is they don't want to have bank runs because mm-hmm. that's that's something else that can happen with this negative rate situation is where everybody just starts pulling their money out of banks. If I'm going to lose money on it anyway, why don't I just keep it under my mattress? Exactly. You know? So, yeah. I mean, at least it's not losing anything there. Yeah. Because if it's in if it's in the bank and you have a negative interest rate, yeah. you're losing money from the negative interest rate, and yeah. you're still losing from inflation. Exactly. So you're losing from both ends. <laughs> yeah. Might as well at least cut one of those off, the mm-hmm. one you can control. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing that scares me more than anything, though, is, the, is a record of, all, like you of were saying, of every transaction, of every transaction mm-hmm. that you completely do away with an underground market. Yeah. Well, and you completely do away with any kind of private transaction that you can keep secret. Exactly. And there's plenty of reasons besides criminality to keep your Wholeheartedly transactions agree. secret. Wholeheartedly um, agree. And a, a really good example, I, I know we talk about this a lot, but it, like going back to uh, firearms here mm-hmm. in, in the U.S. Um, now, right now, I still have the right to have all my guns. Yep. But if there is a record of every transaction where I purchased a gun and they do decide in the future to take away my right to defend myself, then they know like yeah. how many and which guns I have. Exactly. And they know, they know exactly who's addressed to come to, to, <laughs> to come collect. Unless you lost in them their, all in a horrible boating accident. In the involuntary buyback. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I say, man, boating accident. It was a stormy day out there. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to shoot that grunnel. Because <laughs> right. you don't want to bring them on the boat. They tear up the, all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. um, <sighs> well, I think we've about exhausted that. I hope so. I mean, yeah. definitely if you have questions after this, let me know. I know that this is really complex stuff. Yeah, it's a heavy subject. It's definitely a tall order to take on. But... um. But like I say, if people want to come back and have questions or whatnot, definitely message us about it. And we could talk about it again on the podcast if there's something that really gets stirred up. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have gone into more detail about all of my friends' questions from the last economics podcast that we had. Yeah. Um, so Economics, you know, is, is there's a lot to it. And I find mm-hmm. it extremely interesting. I mean, I'm I completely do. self-taught on this. Like, I've got no... But but that's the amazing thing about the times we live in. You can be self-taught on something like this. Absolutely. All you have to do is go out there and do the research. All the information is there. Mm-hmm. It absolutely is. And the counter-information. So absolutely. you can make up your you own You can mind. find all sides of any angle 
I mean, it's there. Sometimes you got to dig a little more, especially if you're an Austrian. <laughs> yeah, um, but there's always Mises.org. Well, that's the place to go. Yeah. Yep. That and Fee. I like Fee a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Fee's, Fee's a good one. Yeah. Um, Ah, there's several actually. Oh, yeah. like, there's plenty of good ones. You just got to know where they are and where to look. You know, and um, you know, listen to uh, what's the Milton Friedman? Listen oh, to what man. he said. Um, don't pay any attention to what he actually advocated when he started <laughs> talking with governments and so forth. But if you if you read what he wrote and listen to what he said in his lectures, like a lot of that's really good. Years ago, and it hadn't been recently, I was posting quite a few of his videos to our page just yeah. because they were like, I mean, the way he breaks it down is so mm -hmm. easy to understand yeah and so i would i may start doing that again periodically mm -hmm. dropping one of his videos on our page yeah but, um i encourage people to go look him up I yeah mean, he's certainly more compelling in a lecture than somebody like rothbard unfortunately oh, yeah. Yeah. um but uh but his and then the debate like the lot. things that when he when it came down to it the things that he actually advocated were definitely not in what, line with what with our about, ideas yeah. about what a real free market economics is about. Yeah. Um, he, he talked a big game, but then he, you know, he's the one that he advocated for uh, the payroll deductions and things like that, you know? Yeah. And, and he went down like he was advising countries, governments about how to run their economies, but in a way that like from the top down, from the using government using, force, yeah. uh, enforced the free market idea, which is just Doesn't, kind of yeah, like kind it's, of it's blasphemous, yeah. <laughs> right. right? Like, how can you use the government to enforce a free market? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. The, the government's just got to get out of the way, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, like I, I have some issues certainly with some of the things that Milton Friedman actually advocated, but his lectures are really good and his books are really good, agreed. Um, now, this is kind of a little in-between thing here. Uh, How are we looking? We're at you know, 30-something minutes. Um, so I don't really have a whole lot to talk about with this because I didn't get time to really research it. But I just found this, I just found this interesting. Um, so uh, a, a D.C. U.S. District Judge um, dismissed a case brought by uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this name probably. Um, Bilal Abdul Karim, okay. who is a, a United States citizen, born here, born in the U.S., freelance journalist, um, and he was seeking to challenge his placement. This is in a civil suit, uh, seeking to challenge his placement on a kill list uh, by U.S. defense forces in Syria, uh, where he was working um, and interacting with militants linked to Al Qaeda in order to do his journalism. You hmm. know. Um, get information yeah. and he says that he had several near misses from drone strikes really? and uh, believes that he is on some kind of state kill list, kill list. yeah um, and was trying to to challenge his placement on that kill list is his assumption is that he was mistaken for being a militant because he's interacting with some of these people gathering yeah. information yeah all right um, now the case was thrown out it, it was dismissed uh, because the United States government, the federal government, invoked the state secrets privilege, really? um, claiming that disclosure of any information about this uh, could al <laughs> this is great uh -oh. could allow him to evade further attempts on his life, right, <laughs> or compromise intelligence sources. That's just insanity to me. Uh, I mean, it it seems to me. If if he is in fact on this kill list, mm -hmm. that well, they won't admit that a kill list exists. Well, no, and that well, there you go, and that maybe that's where the the issue is. But mm -hmm. if he is in fact on this list, he ought to be. And I mean, clearly he must be. I mean, I mean it certainly would seem that way. Yeah, it's um, quite coincidental. Yeah. Say, yeah, um, that that he needs that if he came forward and was like, look, am I on this list? Yeah, he should be able to at least be. In, informed, maybe not yeah. like in a public setting, but well, maybe not. But he ought to be able to challenge his placement on that, and that's where like, I'm going. Yeah, mm -hmm. he should be able to challenge that, and and whatever it is should be able to be hashed out. I mean, if he's actually done something criminal, they ought to bring charges and take him to court. Yeah, um, and I, I should have written down the quote from his lawyer, who afterwards said something along the lines of. I'm going to paraphrase here because I can't remember the quote exactly. Um, the, essentially that the judge had determined that uh, the federal government keeping secrets was more important than 
um, him being able to defend, uh, to protect his own life against that government. That's insane, man. Um, and, and so they've completely wow. deprived this guy of due process. And, Where's he at now? And, you know, his, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, he's he clearly was back in this country to bring the suit, so I, I'm not yeah. entirely sure. Just I mean, but if his livelihood is out there reporting on what's going on, yeah. then he's going to go back there. Yeah, I mean, he has to. Yeah. You know. yeah. Um, unless he's on a no-fly list, too, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that would be kind of crazy to be on the kill list and not on the no-fly list. Yeah, like, you would that, think. That would be your government at work right there. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, the the... It's the Fifth Amendment, right, that gives you um, – that says that you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that's exactly what they're depriving him of here. Absolutely. Without question. Yeah. Without question. Wow. And with that, as long as we're talking about you know ignoring the Constitution anyway, yeah. um, there have been – they have – they have launched an impeachment inquiry – into yeah. Donald Trump uh, about this phone call with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, um, who is the president of Ukraine. Yeah. And who's the the recently elected president of Ukraine this year. Um, and I, I recommend that everybody go – it's dry, but yeah. I, I recommend everybody go read the complaint. Yeah. And read the the memo of the uh, phone conversation. The transcript that's been released. Yeah. yeah. It's not a transcript. Yeah, it's not exactly a transcript, but it reads like one. It does. Um, and it's probably pretty close. Yeah. And uh, I, to me, like I read this, like there's nothing there. Um, yeah. <laughs> everything that they're talking about um, has to be inferred. There's... And yeah. I'm not saying that there's no wrongdoing there, but I'm just saying that there's no way that you could ever prove a case about this. Yeah, this wouldn't work in court. There's nothing explicitly stated. Actually, Zelensky seems to lead the conversation, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, Trump did talk about, uh, you know, looking into Hunter Biden, looking into uh, CrowdStrike and the, um, you know, uh, Ukrainian um connection to the election interference stuff. Yeah. And honestly, like very matter of factly, I think that he can easily make a case that that is in the national interest. Yeah. Both of those things. Well, I, and I think um, so too. And wasn't that investigation shut down under the Obama administration? Uh, yeah. Um, specific. Well, you mean the, the case the, looking the into Hunter Biden? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, <laughs> there's so much about that. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in it. I get it. Because, I mean, it's just not worthwhile. But this is what I would say. I don't know how you can make a case that um, that even if you assume that everything that they're claiming is correct. It's true, yeah. Um, that, the, that Donald Trump – now, I'll also say this. I think any kind of uh, U.S. interaction um, – with a foreign power, yeah. like there's always the threat of force behind it. Oh, Doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's an implied <coughs> threat every time Anytime. America interacts with anybody. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because we have the largest military in the world by far. And we like to use it. And we like to use it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can <laughs> you can say that there's some coercion every time the U.S. asks anybody to do anything. Yeah. Right? And nobody would make that claim. Well, you might make that claim, but it's not yeah. <laughs> its not impeachable anyway. Exactly. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's really hard to make a case that, that uh, Donald Trump's implied threat, which he never made, yeah. but implied threat, because he never even mentioned this foreign aid money. Yeah, right? never even came up. Um, and they weren't aware until after the fact that he, was, he had held it anyway. Yeah. Like... <laughs> when he spoke with the Ukrainians, this four hundred and fifty million dollars in aid that he was holding as a threat, yeah. he didn't mention it in the phone call, and they weren't aware that it was being held. So as far as they knew, they were still getting it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but assuming that he, like, maybe through Giuliani, had told them this or something, yeah. I don't know how you. Anyway, uh, that would, back channels would work. I don't know how you make the case that Donald Trump's implied threat of holding this $450 million of military aid um, in exchange for 
them looking into or continuing an investigation of reopening, um, reopening as as, an investigation yeah. of um, another presidential potential presidential candidate, another primary candidate, uh, is more corrupt somehow than Joe Biden's explicit threat of holding the billion dollars in aid um, if they didn't fire the prosecutor that was looking into the company that his son was working for in Ukraine. Exactly. Like, how can you make the case that one of them is bad and the other one's fine? And and that kind of goes back to if, you know, Biden's kind of screwed here. There's no real win situation for Biden in this. Yeah, I agree. I'm kind of... I kind of wonder about the whole thing. Like this feeds into my theory that um, Hillary Clinton's going to enter the race. The race. Well, I'll <laughs> tell you something though. Hillary Clinton enters this race. It is going to get bad because mm-hmm. Trump is going to pull every one of these type of tricks on her because yeah. he's got the justice system now. Yeah. Like I mean, he all he yeah, has. To, I don't think that he really does. No, um, he's, besides, he's already beat her, beaten her once. He doesn't need to do anything. Yeah. I really think I, I don't know. She I, cannot win. She doesn't think she cannot win, but, but she, she cannot win. Yeah. I, I I still believe that even, she's going to enter the primary race before the end of the year. Even I, I think you. I think there's a 50-50 shot. I think you could be right about that. Yeah. But I, honestly, I, I think at the end of the day, she knows that she's got too much to lose going against Trump. Now that he's in the White House, I think there's too many ways he can open up investigations. And, and there's, and there's, and there's the, stuff there. It's not like there's nothing there. And this, she knows there's stuff there. The, this is way off track. But she believes that this election, that the last election was stolen from her. She does believe that. When there's no um, she question believes about that. that she is the rightful heir to, to the, the presidents. Yeah, um, and I, I don't think that there would, there's any convincing her. And um, Biden has now dropped below Elizabeth Warren, mm-hmm. as I understand it, in the most that's, recent that's polls. That's what I hear too. And that's the trigger. I figure as long as Biden was in the We're lead, strong. that there, that she probably wouldn't enter the race. Yeah. Um, but if if Biden's going out, if he's on the outs, yeah. then I think that she will enter the race. And I think the Democrats want that to happen, too, because they want a they don't want party Warren. loyalist. Yeah, they don't want um, Warren in there. In they there. don't want a you know no. progressive radical yeah. like Elizabeth Warren. Or Bernie Sanders. And besides the fact that the Clintons still control the, the Democratic Party's... Um, the machine's still there. Yeah, the funding machine. Yeah. The machine's still intact. Yeah. I mean, all she has to do is... is Drop her hat and, and mm-hmm. you know. But that's all so, beside the point. <laughs> it, it is like, kind of beside the point, but it's kind of not. I'm telling you. Just remember I said that when she enters the race before the end of the year. We'll see. Um, you know, I, I will I will replay this clip over and over again. <laughs> and if she doesn't, then oops. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I think, but, I think there's a strong chance that may be what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, so... Just to give a little bit of background on this thing, like Hunter Biden. All right, so right after, in 2014, um, right after the U.S. funded and orchestrated coup in Ukraine, overthrew the government and um, placed uh, Poroshenko, um, Petro Poroshenko, in the presidency, and um, Yatsenyuk, uh, I can't remember his first name, in as prime minister. Minister, yeah. and if you'll remember, there was the famous phone call that was leaked, um, where uh, Victoria Newland was, you know, saying "F the EU." This is the guy that we're going to put in power. You know, he's yeah. he's on our side, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so right after that, and um, Obama named Joe Biden as the special envoy to the Ukraine. I actually, remember that. Yep. And uh, and at that time, um, Hunter Biden uh, was appointed to the board. Of, of Burisma, which was a private gas company in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, now, that might seem okay. I, I mean, at the very least, I think it's a conflict of interest there, but... You'd think so. Um, but if you add on to this that he had no experience in the industry, yeah, um, and that he didn't even speak the language, right? Uh, then I think it kind of leads you to believe that he was appointed in that position as a favor... Um, in order to have the ear of somebody who had influence in the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, that, that of course, being the Vice President Biden, who is now the special envoy of Ukraine. Yeah. And he and Hunter Biden was making like $50,000 a month. 
uh, to do this. Like yeah. more than half a million dollars a year to essentially do nothing. Yeah. Um, and he was also involved with a lobbying firm in the U.S. And I read an article the other day, and I can't remember all the specifics, but they were saying you know the claim that they had pushed. Uh, well, okay. So Biden then bragged about directly threatening, like in a um, Council on Foreign Relations committee meeting later, uh, Biden like openly bragged about directly threatening um, President Poroshenko and the Prime Minister Yatsenyuk uh, with withholding a billion dollar loan. Uh, from the U.S. if they didn't fire the state prosecutor who was investigating Burisma, uh, investigating corruption in Burisma. Yeah. Now, there's no, there's not necessarily any reason to think that they were investigating corruption related to Hunter Biden yeah. uh, as a member of the board. The story is that they were investigating some corruption from before the coup. But clearly uh, Biden was concerned. Yeah. Um, and now they do say that they had planned to interview Hunter Biden, though. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and then there's some documentation that has been uh, released both from the Ukrainian government and from the lobbying firm that Hunter Biden was attached to here in the U.S. Uh, that suggest, and like I said, I can't remember the specifics now, but because it, I just honestly I don't think this is all that important. Yeah. Um, but uh, that suggests that they were like it was definitely like the whole thing was just a lie like yeah. the idea that this guy that the um that the prosecutor was a corrupt individual uh that you know there's commentary about that they you know they're sorry about making all that stuff up about him but you needed some kind of public cover yeah. for you know firing this guy and all kinds of stuff so mm. um and then immediately after he was replaced this lobbying firm was contacting the new guy almost immediately you know, to talk about Hunter Biden and how they were going to proceed with the investigation. And, you know, anyway. Yeah. So it's it's questionable, at least. Right? Yeah. Um, now, and as far as President Trump suspending the foreign aid about, you know, as a supposedly a quid pro quo to investigate this stuff, um, he suspended foreign aid months earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. To several organizations and countries, yeah. um, it included, um, <coughs> and that had been done, you know, like they actually suspended the foreign aid in August, but he talked about it earlier. I mean, this is a guy who was already trying to cut foreign aid spending by like 30%, yeah. uh, which he almost did. Um, and, uh, you know, the aid that was cut later also included aid to Pakistan and Uzbekistan. Um, so, I, I don't know. There's just like... Yeah. The idea that this is directly related to whether he was going to do these investigations or not seems like seems it's certainly uncertain. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I don't know. The, the whole thing just seems like a waste of time, really. Like, there's no way that you can present any kind of credible evidence to uh, – I, I mean, I, I just don't think that you can prove high crimes per, and misdemeanors. Per, providing there's not something else we don't know about. Right, right. Which – it doesn't really look like there is at this point. Yeah. I mean, that's... Um, I mean, and, you know, the the leak, and I'm going to call it a, a leak. I, the idea that this is a whistleblower is beyond my understanding. Like, uh, he, the person didn't have firsthand knowledge of the event. Yeah. Um, Which, was, by the way, there's a term for that that we use in court. I call it, oh, yeah, well, hearsay. Hearsay. You know, like, it was all yeah. hearsay uh, and inference. Um, and I would say that he's like calling him a whistleblower is just a misnomer. Um, if you don't have firsthand knowledge, then you're a rumor monger. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and and Trump's already released plenty of information here to yeah. the public. I don't think they were ready even... for that either. No, um, they weren't. They absolutely weren't. And then at, you know Adam Schiff had made some. Where did I hear this? I might have heard it on No Agenda. Uh, anyway, he had released some tweet earlier about. Um, that was somehow related to this, and then the Justice Department changed their rules about how they define whistleblowers yes. right beforehand. Like this, I was saw something planned. about this. Yeah, because it was back in July they changed it from because it used to be you couldn't use hearsay, right, it, to to be a whistleblower, and they changed that mm -hmm. to try and protect him. Yeah, um, and so I, you know that's all a bunch of malarkey as far as I'm concerned. I, yeah, the, the whole thing is just a well, waste of time. It and, just seems it does seem strange to me that you know I mean it's all just a political game, mm -hmm. but that 
the fact that this is where they went with impeachment after everything that has been put out yeah. there and that has been done. Like this is where this is where we are. Yeah. You well, know? and the, the funny <laughs> thing is that the, like the real you know paradox about this is that they've spent all the, they spent two years saying that he was a Russian agent. Yeah. And when that fell apart, they've now turned around and said that he's allied with the Ukrainians. <laughs> Who, if you don't know out there, yeah, they and the Russians are not buddies. Yeah, no, no joke. <laughs> um, so it, uh, like, it doesn't it doesn't really hold water. And what it, it just almost goes to show you that either Trump is just this good at being corrupt, or mm-hmm. there's just nothing there. Because yeah. to survive an inquiry like with the Russia deal, mm-hmm. that he, like he did, mm-hmm. I mean, if there was anything there. Anything at all, yeah. we would know about it. It would have been in that report, and and they came out with basically nothing. Mm-hmm. So and it, they they came out with basically nothing and tried to word it in such a way that it that appeared to be sounded something like anyway. something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I mean, that just goes to tell you that this is this is just a fool's errand. Like there's just that it's not there, man. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I, so to me. The more interesting aspect of this, and I think I'm going to write an article in more detail about this, but I did want to mention it here um, because this is something that we should really pay more attention to. I, I think that this is has more of an effect on us. Yeah. Um, is that like the thing that stood out to me that nobody's talking about is here we are. We're giving Ukraine a 450 million dollar loan for military aid. Yeah. Um, and and we've actually done that now. Yeah. Um, and what they were talking about on the phone is that Vladimir Zelensky was saying we need we want to take next steps to buy a javelin, um, which is a light anti tank weapon. It's a you know essentially a bazooka, right? Like right. in common parlance, it's a, it's a shoulder shoulder mounted like single man uh, rocket that can be used to destroy tanks. Nice. All right. Um, and uh, so. That's what he's talking about. And of course, the um, Javelin uh, uh, system yeah. is built by uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Okay. So, really, this is a this is just another way of um, them privatizing tax money. Yep. All right. So, you pay your taxes to the government because you have no choice. Yep. They take your money. They say we're gonna we're gonna give foreign aid. And when most people think of foreign aid, they're thinking of the, you know... Starving like, kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? And medicine and what have you. Yep. So they're going to take your, your money and they're going to send foreign aid um, to the Ukraine in the amount of $450 million, which the Ukraine is now going to turn around and buy U.S. weaponry with. Yeah, um, from U.S. companies. Yep. Yeah. So it's just a way of them taking your tax money, sending it to a third party. Now they don't even. It's need a to redistribution of wealth. Yeah, socialism <laughs> to the rich. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> um, and they'll buy. They'll privatize the money by making purchases from U.S. private companies. Yeah. Of course, the government doesn't need the third party. They do it themselves all the time. Oh, they absolutely. take your tax money and they buy stuff from Lockheed Martin and Raytheon yeah. and General Dynamics and uh, Northrop Grumman and all these other companies. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that that's the thing that actually we should focus on, and nobody's talking about that at all. No, not at all, not at all. Um, by the way, all these companies that advertise—that's the NPR, real corruption. Yeah. By the way, I, oh, absolutely. I think, yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's true. It's weird. Yeah. Um, so. So but, that that's that's all I've got. What you, what were you about to? No, I mean that's that's pretty well. I think that sums it up, man. I think that's that clears us out for today. Yeah. Well, good. Um, we're in like right about an hour. Or so uh, now's time for all the plugs. Uh, I yeah. should have taken – here, do some plugs while I try and look up I, what the um, – <laughs> Well, I mean we're on Facebook, so please like and share. The Facebook page seems to be – we've experienced some growth this week, um, and it's due to people sharing. So just like you see something on there you like, like it, share it, put it out in front of people. Um, that's that's the biggest way we're going to grow the page. And I feel like by growing the page, that's how we're going to grow the podcast. Just get more people, you know, involved and listening. So, yeah, that's my plugs, man. Is that all you got? That's Come all on. I got. There's more. <laughs> Is there more? You're going to have to remind me. Where else are we? Oh, well, yeah, Podbeam. Of course, we're on Podbeam. But honestly, if you're listening to the podcast, you've probably figured out we're on Podbeam and iTunes. 
Yeah, so. Podbean and iTunes, you can subscribe there. And and as he said, like and share is really big. Yeah. Um, that, the share really goes a long way. The like is good, but the share, that really, that puts us out in front of other people and it kind of creates this branch effect that, that gets us in front of people. Okay. And uh, so I did check it out. Uh, if you go to goldmoney.com, if you decide that you want to purchase some gold, yeah. um, like I said, my personal opinion is that it's the best way to shelter yourself against inflation and an economic collapse because gold has always been worth something always um and the uh the referral code is the liberty mike ah so i we have our own referral i feel like we've made it yeah and and if i if i understood css better it would be on our web (laughs) page yeah but i don't we'll get there yeah i'm I'm, i've been working on that we'll get there so ah we have a referral code i feel like we've done something yeah now we just need to get one from amazon Oh yeah, yeah right. that's the that's the next big one. Then I then yeah. I can add the um, recommended reading page to ah, our, our website. Nice. That's it's in the works. Cool. We already got plans for that. In the pipeline, you already, you already got you got yeah. you got a list of books people yeah. need to read. I got right? stacks of books all over my house, and we can He's just not like lying. randomly select. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, and we'll be back in hopefully like a, about a week. Like I say, the schedules so. are crazy. We're hope one day we'll get to a solid schedule again, but it's not going to be during softball season. So yeah, yeah, it's just one of them things, man. I'm sorry, and you I might apologize. be late for that. By the way, sorry. Yeah, I'm um, gonna have to roll. Okay, well, uh, in the you know, catch us next time when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later. <laughs>